Today I'll be reading Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bears fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living thing that, that which the waters teems, and that moves about in it according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds in the sky, and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, 
and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. I almost feel like I owe Bertha an apology today. That's a lot of reading. But, first of all, I'm jumping around a little bit in Genesis 1. But secondly, have you ever listened to someone read like that before today? Because I imagine it's really familiar. But how do you not get a sense of awe in that moment? God's so wonderfully creative. It's so incredibly a story. And I don't think we often do these justice. We tend to glance over them and glaze over them. Today I get the pleasure of talking about a doctrine which every Christian should believe in and believes, but very few people, including myself, really understand or comprehend. I think I struggle a little bit with it. I personally believe as we enter into our series of Back to the Basics, our understanding of who God is is way beyond the foundational of our beliefs. It's critical. If we get the concept of who God is wrong, I think we lose the entire foundation of what our belief system is about. So that's where we're starting in this series. In the next couple of weeks, you'll hear from Marvin next week, uh, who's going to talk about other faiths, which I find fascinating. And then the debut of Graham is going to be the week after that. He's going to talk about creation care and how our deeds make a difference. So look forward to those two. It'd be easy to say as Christians that God and the Trinity has always been a belief system that we accepted and acknowledged. But did you know it was formally uh, proclaimed in the Artesian Creed in the 6th century, which is about five, 600 years after Jesus died? Before this, it was debated. We didn't really have a, a clear understanding where God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit fit into this and what their relationship looked like with each other. So it took a group of people sitting down and articulating this. And after that, pretty much everyone in mainstream Christianity believes it. To us now, it's a non-issue. Like so many of our beliefs, we just accept them. But at one time, they were not unified. There was huge agreement or disagreements at one time, even involving deaths and excommunication and things like that. I am very grateful in church today that we can disagree on things and just have a fairly level-headed conversation and come to conclusions together. That wasn't always the case. Today, our starting place in this conversation about God is in Genesis 1, which I think is the proper place to start. I love this account in Genesis 1. As I said, it's so creative. It speaks so much to God's character to me. His creativity, his intentionality, his desire for community as a creator, his deep care, his deep love. It says so many things. How can you not read this and not have a sense of wonder and awe? Genesis 1, 1 and 2 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In the beginning was God. Everything else was just not. Can you picture everything we know as a reality today as a void, as nothing? But God was still there in that space. In Genesis 1.1, what it does not do is define which part of God is doing the creating. Was it the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit in our understanding? Or is it something different? I like that in Genesis 1-1, the word for God is actually Elohim, which I probably realized, and I'm sorry. (laughs) But the Hebrew word for God is Elohim, which means it's a plural type of sense, but has a singular meaning. When used in a singular meaning in the Hebrew Bible, Elohim usually refers to our creator God, or the God of Israel. Yahweh. Now in my brain, in my North American way of thinking, I have a hard time with this. It's an idea and a concept of one thing being plural that really confuses me. Maybe it's a language we use where our understanding and grammar don't have a lot of space for things that don't make sense. But the fact is in Genesis, we still have the three persons of God in one entity. It's three in one. And they're creating everything as a team. Much of my studying for today originated with our Canadian Conference Confession of Faith. Or if you really like reading, you can do the expanded version, which is even more fun. But in the next, uh, in most of the series, we're going to be using these books. Article 1 talks about God in four sections. The first section is simply labeled God. 
And it reads like this. We believe in the one true living God, creator of heaven and earth. God is almighty in power, perfect in wisdom, righteous in judgment, overflowing in steadfast love. God is the sovereign who rules over all things visible and invisible, the shepherd who rescues the lost and helpless. God is the refuge and a fortress for those in need. God is a consuming fire, perfect in holiness, yet slow to anger and abounding in tender mercy. God comforts like a loving mother, trains and disciplines like a caring father, and persists in covenant love like a faithful husband. We confess God as eternal Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is what our confession of faith says. Our confession of faith speaks to this God who is one with three very distinct personalities. As we read through Genesis 1, you may notice God is mentioned 29 times in here. I did count them because some of you would probably question that. It is clearly something the writer here wants us to take notice of. God is the main character in this account. We get caught up in the creation often, but it's really about God. So it's something important to notice. You also need to take notice in Genesis 26, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over all the fish of the sea, over all the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Up until now, God is talking in this plural form, which uh, is a little confusing. He's talking as Elohim. But here God moves to talking about as God the Father. Before moving on with this conversation, I'd like to pause with the statement, let us make God in our image. There are five basic ideas within this that this has been talked about or five conclusions people would make. The first is that God was having a conversation with the angels around him, bragging about uh, creation a little bit. But nowhere in scripture is the idea that angels were created in God's image. So this idea is rejected by scholars most of the time. Second, God is talking to the earth who he created man out of. But if we read Isaiah 40, 13, 14, it says, Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Who did the Lord consult and enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge? Who showed him the path of understanding? So I think it's fairly easy to conclude that God probably didn't consult with anyone besides himself when figuring out what he should do with creation. Three, the Hebrew writers tended to uh, use plural language when talking about majestic things. They would talk about the heavens, not heaven. They were pluralized things that were really important. Number four, God is talking out loud to himself as he's preparing to uh, make mankind. And he's having that conversation with himself. And the fifth one is that he's having a conversation as the Trinity as he's moving to the pinnacle of his creation. He's having a talk within the Godhead about, hey, this is our next step. Scholars like to disagree. And if you've talked to lots of scholars, they always like to disagree. But the conclusion usually leads to the idea that this is a conversation among the Trinity or it's a form of language. Either way, I think the basic idea in Genesis 1 is the same. God is multiple persons, and that's fully accepted in Genesis 1, and he's also one God. With all that said, let's move on from Genesis 1 and back to the confession of faith for a moment. With our understanding of God as three distinct personalities, I would like to talk about God the Father for a moment. It says in our confession of faith, God the Father is the source of all life. In him we live and move and have our being. The Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth, and hears the prayers of all who call on him. In the fullness of time, the Father sent his Son for the salvation of the world. Through Jesus Christ, the Father adopts all who respond in faith to the gospel forgiving those who repent of their sin and entering into this new covenant with them. God gives the counselor of the Holy Spirit to all his children. God's creative and redemptive love sustains this world until the end of the age. We can call God Father for many reasons. The Bible Coalition is a group of scholars that work a lot with MBs also, and they give us these thoughts, there's three of them. 
that God is our creator and father to all of us because he created. Number two, he has always been father to Israel through the Old Testament. They talk about that often. He is always forgiving and redeeming Israel over and over again, just as he sent Jesus to do for us now. And he's father to us through the acceptance of his son, the price paid for our redemption. When we think of God the Father, most people would talk about how God is to be feared. Maybe not the Old Testament fear of the respect for his holiness, but fear because in the Old Testament he always seems to be destroying, killing, or telling people to go back in time and do other things. I do know some Christians and many non-Christians that would view God as an abusive and egocentric father. Certainly, I know people that don't have a relationship with him would see him that way. But also some who love God dearly can view him in some very unhealthy ways. God can be viewed as violent and unfair by some. Not the loving and redeeming father we would like to see. Now, I do know many Christians who love the New Testament with God the Son who's all happy and loving and kind and our best friend. But they would also totally reject the Old Testament because it, they just can't understand the two combined. In their thinking, the Old Testament has been replaced with the new. God simply provided a new way of having a relationship with him. So why even read it or try to understand it? It's simply outdated and it doesn't make sense. I think we don't do it justice if we're not willing to grapple with the tensions. Firstly, I think we get in a lot of trouble if we intentionally try to pick our favorite part of God. I know all of us relate differently to things, but if we resonate with one part of the Godhead more than another, and we choose to ignore other parts, I don't think we can have a full relationship with God in any form. When we have a huge issue with God, it's usually because we haven't taken the time to try to understand or try to grapple with the tensions we feel. This, of course, makes sense because it's impossible to fully understand God, and it is really complicated, but that doesn't give us an excuse to not try. To favor one part makes us unable to fully experience God as a whole, and we do that disjustice. But I'm digressing here. God the Father is a loving creator who continually brings us back into a great relationship with him, even if it meant the death of his own son, the second part of the Godhead namely Jesus. Again, back to our confession of faith, it states, the Son, through whom all things are created and who all things, or holds all things together, is the image of the invisible God. Conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, Jesus took on human nature to redeem the fallen world. He revealed the fullness of God through his obedient and sinless life, through word and deed. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, bringing good news to the poor, release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. Jesus triumphed over sin through his death and resurrection and was exalted as the Lord of creation and the church. The Savior of the world invites all to be reconciled with God, offering peace to those far and near, and calling on them to follow him in the way of the cross. Until the Lord Jesus returns in glory, he intercedes for believers, acts as their advocate, and calls them to be his witnesses. We call Jesus the Son of God simply because he's not a lesser part of God, but because that's what he called himself through scripture. Like in John 5.18, it says, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but also because he was calling God his own father, making himself an equal to God. As well as John 1, 1 to 5 by the apostles. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with the word in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that had ever been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome it. And in verse 14 of John 1, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory in the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus is clearly accepted as God through scripture. So that's not a question we should have or could have. 
is true that with his birth in the world, he chose to fully identify as a human while still being God. To me, that's a really big one, which I can't get my head around half the time, why he would want to do that and why we were worth it. But still, that is what he chose to do to reconcile them. It's also true that he had submitted to God the Father while on earth. He chose to limit his power and his awareness on earth. He would often pray to the Father to do miracles, to take the cup from Jesus in the garden if possible, and he cried out to his Father on the cross while he was hanging there. Where the Father is creator and redeemer in our lives, Jesus bridged that gap between the Father and mankind and was the high priest and the mediator to his people. He is the savior to the world and the head of the church. It's also important to see Jesus revealing the hiddenness and mystery of God all the time. He allows us to see God where he was unseen in the mystery before that. This also brought different access to God. Before God the Father, he often spoke through prophets, through different people. Here, the Son spoke directly to people, walked with people, and lived with people. We have a totally different access. This direct access was missing with the Father. And now, as Jesus went back up to heaven, it's missing again. We don't have the same direct access. Except we have the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Let's again start reading through the Confession of Faith and what it has to say about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Counselor, is the creative power, presence, and wisdom of God. The Spirit convicts people of sin, gives them new life, guides them in all truth. By the Spirit, believers are baptized into one body. The indwelling Spirit testifies that they are God's children, distributes gifts for ministry, empowers for witness, and produces the fruit of righteousness. As comforter, the Holy Spirit helps God's children in their weakness, intercedes for them according to God's will, and assures them of eternal life. Most certainly, the Holy Spirit is the most understood and misrepresented part of the Godhead. Where Jesus dwelt among us, the Holy Spirit now lives among and in all of us as believers. The Spirit of God is intertwined with us now. What I mean by the Holy Spirit being misunderstood has to do with he doesn't always seem to follow the rules we would expect of God. The Holy Spirit seems to be unpredictable and a bit confusing at best at times. Now, if we're honest, all persons of the Godhead are unpredictable and confusing. They never seem to stick with the same pattern, the little world we have for them. The Father would instruct one person to do something, then another person to do the opposite. Jesus would spit in mud to heal someone or call some one person to follow him and not someone else. The Holy Spirit's the same, gifting me one way and Trent and Monica a different way and making us totally unique. He changes the gifts as we mature and we get to follow him where he's willing to lead us, somewhat reluctantly at times. For us, the Holy Spirit is very present and real help in our lives, or should be. I've made up a little list, actually I stole a little list, let's be honest, working the Holy Spirit in our lives, and there's 24 points here. He gives us wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. He gives prophecies and visions. He leads us. He speaks through us. He empowers us. He fills us with joy. He teaches us. He gives us new birth. He guides us to the truth. He lives in us and fills us constantly. He gives us boldness. He encourages us. He delivers God's loves into our hearts. He facilitates our adoption into God's family. He intercedes for us. He gives us hope. He sanctifies us. He reveals God's thoughts to us. He distributes spiritual gifts to us. He gives us freedom. He gives us victory over sin. He produces fruit in our lives. He strengthens us. And he gives us unity. To me, it's exciting. And maybe it's my charismatic background before I started here a long time ago. But the amount of power and help we receive from the Holy Spirit should overwhelm us constantly. I find him way less confusing than a particular part of God and way more part of the God that seems interested in walking with us 
in us succeeding as Christians in our daily walk. Uh, anyone care to know what my pet peeve about the Holy Spirit is or about our interpretation of? Uh, you're kind of stuck because unless Gerald mutes me now, I have a mic and off we go. The Father and the Son are very much relatable. We use terms like Jesus, Father, Him. We don't always do this with the Holy Spirit. We keep calling the Holy Spirit things like it rather than a person. And I think we keep the Spirit mentally uh, distant in our lives and at bay out of that. The Spirit is very much a part of the Godhead. As hard as it might be to get our head around, He is not an it. The Holy Spirit's a him and very much part of God. The rant's over, thank you. <laughs> but I do believe that God works in the three persons to accomplish his work on earth as one God. The Father created, the Son came to reconcile, and the Holy Spirit resides to give us strength to follow up the mission set for us by him. In today's conclusion, I'd like to tell you a part about uh, something I didn't cover today and likely the most important step after we know about God. On SOAR one year, I had a conversation with my son Devin and Andrew Redekop. Um, if you don't know the three of us very well, you'll know our brains work vastly different. My brain is experiential. I am often based on feelings and butterflies and all those wonderful things. It's not to say I'm not intelligent, I'm actually quite intelligent, it's just the way I process things. I process on how it makes me feel. Andrew and Devin's brains are very analytical and fact-based, <laughs> and they would clearly admit to that quickly. And we've had many great conversations. This particular day, we had a conversation with a bunch of students and leaders around us on SOAR. We talked about our coming to faith and how that happened. For me, it was simply doing the right thing. I felt guilty and convicted. I felt like I could do better, and I felt God's love calling me to him. That's the way I came to faith. The other two, it just made sense. They talked about going through and figuring out all the angles, and in the end, they came to a conclusion mentally that this makes sense. Then they both said the same thing. At the end of understanding, there's always a place where you need faith and belief. All of us can know about God like crazy. But the end, if you're not willing to make him your God and accept him as your savior, it doesn't really matter. Knowing about God isn't the same as knowing God. So my question at the end today is, are you willing to get past what you don't know or can't prove and believe in Jesus and God as your Lord and your God today? Thank you.